This is the anti-Markovnikov addition of water to an alkene. And this reaction is both regioselective and stereoselective. So I'm deliberately drawing the alkene that we're going to use here in such a way that we'll be able to see both of those aspects. So the first thing I would do with my alkene is I would make sure that the two groups that are cis to each other are both wedges or both dashes. Okay. And the other one I'm going to make it a dash. And I'm going to draw in the hydrogen back here so I can see it. So that's how I want to see my alkene. And when you do an anti-Markovnikov addition of water to an alkene, it is a two-step process. The first step will involve using BH3 or B2H6 in an organic solvent. The one that I typically use is THF, but you may use others. And that first step will result in the Markov or sorry, the anti-Markovnikov addition of the boron and the hydrogen so that you end up making an organoborane. Once you have the organoborane and you isolate it, you add the second set of reagents to the organoborane. And that would include peroxide and a form of hydroxide. The potassium is not so important. You can have any cation you want, but you must have a hydroxide. So in order to understand how this reaction actually occurs, we need to talk about boron chemistry. And I hope we remember a few things from class. But boron is extremely unique in that boron doesn't necessarily need an octet. So when we look at BH3, this molecule is trigonal planar. And there is an empty p orbital on the boron. And this is really important. If you look at this long enough, and we have talked about this in class, boron, in this case, looks an awful lot like a carbocation. And the boron is trigonal planar, as would be a carbon in a carbocation. And both have an empty p orbital. The difference here is boron doesn't have a formal charge, whereas carbon would. And so this is a stable species, whereas a carbocation is not. Now, if you remember what a carbocation does, you'll be able to figure out what boron does in the reaction. Carbocations are electron deficient. And as a result of that, they act as very good electron pair acceptors. Boron doesn't necessarily want to accept a pair of electrons, but it can because it has an empty p orbital. There's no reason why boron can't have an octet of electrons. It normally just has six because its formal charge is neutral at this point, but it can have an octet like any other element in that second period there, like boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Um, and so in this case, you need to have an electron pair donor. The electron pair donor in these types of reactions is actually the alkene. I'm going to draw the same one we had on the other slide back there a minute ago. And I want to draw it with the stereochemistry because this is such a stereospecific and regiospecific reaction. Okay. Now, because boron is acting as an electron pair acceptor, it is technically an electrophile, or you can say a Lewis acid. Now, when we've taken double bonds and treated them with protons, I hope you remember that the proton ends up going to the carbon that would make the more stable carbocation. In this case, you are not dealing with a proton, but you are still dealing with, technically, an acid. And so as this pair of electrons from the double bond is given to boron's empty p orbital, boron will tend to go toward the less substituted carbon. And this is because the more substituted carbon can handle the developing positive charge to a greater extent. At the same time, boron doesn't really want this octet. And so a boron-hydrogen bond is going to break. Now, unlike most bonds that are broken between some element and hydrogen, as long as they're nonmetals, metals 
the nonmetal that other than hydrogen usually gets the electrons, but that's not the case here. Boron has an electron negativity of 2.0, whereas hydrogen has an electron negativity of 2.1. And as we've stated many times in class, we give the electrons to the more electronegative atom when a bond is broken. So if this BH bond is broken, hydrogen actually gets the electrons, not the boron. And so it acts as a source of electrons, and it's called a hydride. So when we move the arrows here, this pair of electrons from the double bond will go into the empty p orbital of boron. And as that occurs, the BH bond is broken. And again, remember the boron is going to go to the less substituted carbon, and the hydride will end up going to the more substituted carbon. And this happens simultaneously. And they do add to the same side of the double bond. So I'm going to make sure I draw that in such a way that you can see this here on the next slide. So what was a wedge stays a wedge. And what was a dash stays a dash. Okay. We added the boron to the less substituted carbon because it acted as the acid, kind of like the proton that we've had previously. And the hydride adds to the more substituted carbon. Now, this is what you actually produce, but just so you know where electrons went, the electrons that were here making the double bond have ended up right here. And the electrons that were making the BH bond are now here. So we have transferred electrons from one location to another. Okay. So I'm going to redraw that complex without the colors so that we can see that and see what's going to happen in the next step. This is isolatable. Now, I'm going to draw on my boron R groups because this process would actually occur two more times since there are literally two more um, quantities of hydrogen on that boron. So I'm just going to write those as R groups. They may be hydrogens. They may be other alkenes that have added to that boron at that point in time. This is the complex we have after step one. That's the end of step one. Now comes the harder part. This is step two, where we add the peroxide and the hydroxide. Okay. Initially, you would have a separate flask where you react the peroxide with the hydroxide. And what happens in that flask is normal acid-base chemistry. Hopefully, you remember from what we've talked about many times Hydroxide is considered a fairly decent base. It's a strong base. And we're going to react it with this peroxide. Now the pKa of peroxide is such that this proton is acidic enough for the hydroxide to take one of these hydrogens away. So we're just doing acid-base chemistry here. And as a result of that, we're going to make some water. and what's called the hydroperoxide anion. Now, this hydroperoxide anion right here is what's going to do the chemistry in the next step. So I'm going to redraw some things again on the next slide for us for a moment. I'm going to redraw our organoborane that we made in the first step of this reaction. At this point in time, it would be added to the flask with this hydroperoxide anion. And this is where the mechanism starts to get a little bit crazy. Now this anion is still a decent base. It's not the best base we've ever had. It's not as strong as hydroxide, 
that's good because we like to do favorable reaction chemistry. That's why the last step worked. But it, it's still a good base. And boron, as you can see here, is again going to only have three groups attached to it. So it is again trigonal planar, and it again has an empty p orbital. And again, it's going to act as an electron pair acceptor. So what's going to happen here is this oxygen will donate its lone pair into boron's empty p orbital. As a result of that, we make a new intermediate. This is now where we're at. Now, as we've mentioned previously, oh, I've got my charge right here. It's important. Boron doesn't really want an octet. It can have an octet, but it doesn't really want an octet. So boron's going to break a bond to one of these four groups attached to it. The most polarized bond, as you can see, is the boron-oxygen bond. And if that bond breaks, oxygen will take the electrons. And that would be non-productive chemistry. You go right back where you were a moment before. The other option is to break the boron-carbon bond. Now, this is an option. And it's actually what is going to occur. Now, out of those two atoms, carbon is the more electronegative element. So carbon will take the electrons in the boron-carbon bond. And this is kind of sort of like a methyl shift or a hydride shift. It moves those electrons over to an adjacent atom, and it's actually going to move those over to the adjacent oxygen atom. As that occurs, oxygen says, hey, wait a minute. I can't have two, three bonds. So an oxygen-oxygen bond has got to break. And this bond is broken, and the electrons are given to this other oxygen. You're going to get a totally new intermediate. Hydrogen. Now, we just had this carbon bind to the oxygen, which is still bound to the boron. Now boron is neutral again. I'm trying to draw things in the same orientation they were a moment ago, so it's easier to see where things were. But again, I'm going to show you where they are. This is where we are now at. Okay, this is this intermediate that we have just formed. But just to make you aware as to where electrons were a moment ago, this pair of electrons right here that's making this carbon-oxygen bond, it was here making this carbon-boron bond. And this pair of electrons right here was making an oxygen-oxygen bond. That's where things were a moment ago. So I'm going to redraw this intermediate again so that we can look at it. And then we also have some hydroxide in here. Okay. All right, so this is now where we are. We're still on our way to making the alcohol. We haven't quite got there yet, but we're getting close. It's now water that comes in and does some business. Now, we made water in the very first step of the second half of the reaction. Oh. Yeah, bear with me as we start doing some chemistry. Now remember, boron keeps playing this hot potato game with the electrons. It can't seem to decide if it wants to keep six 
or if it would rather have H. It has this empty P orbital. Now, hydroxide could add back into the system, but that's not going to get us anywhere productive. But water will get us somewhere productive. So what's going to happen is this oxygen of water is going to donate its electrons onto boron's empty P orbital. And as that is occurring, boron says, hey, I don't know if I really want an octet of electrons, so I'm going to break the most polar bond that I have, which is this boron-oxygen bond. And those electrons are going to go to the oxygen. That means the oxygen is gaining a negative charge. As that is occurring, oxygen will use those electrons to pick up a proton from water. As that proton is being picked up, the OH bond breaks. So we've basically got a big cycle of electrons moving around. So again, the oxygen from water donates its lone pair to the boron. As that happens, boron breaks a bond, and it breaks the most polar bond, the boron-oxygen bond. Oxygen is more electronegative, so oxygen takes the electrons. It gain, it's gaining some negative character. And as that occurs, it uses that extra electron density to pick off the proton from water. And as that proton is being removed, the OH bond breaks, and oxygen gains that electron density. So as a result of all of this, what do you get? Well, you make the alcohol that we've been shooting for all along. Okay, now this boron reagent here that you see, this is just a side product that nobody needs to worry about. The important part is the alcohol we've just made. And as you can see, both of the groups have added in a syn addition to the double bond. The hydrogen and the OH group have added to the same side of the double bond. Now, you could have drawn those on top or on bottom. It's okay either way. And one other very important facet is that the OH group has added to the less substituted carbon and the hydrogen added to the more substituted carbon because this is anti-Markovnikov addition.